What general locations did you did you serve in? Act in the all together or just uh, you can just if you like you can start from the beginning. Well, I did a lot of with East Coast, Paris Island, Camp Lejeune, and uh, Cherry Point, and Miramar, and all that, Florida, and uh, then I went to the West Coast, and uh, around San Diego and up in Los Angeles. Around there at camps and shipped out from San Diego. Three weeks on board ship. Okay. We don't know where we're going because we had a Jap sub on our tail and it was zigzagging all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I had experience on that. It was funny because I got on board ship said I want to shower. So I went in, took a shower, soaked up. I couldn't get the soap out of my hair. It was salt water. <laughs> so I went around around trying to get fresh water for a drink a pound. Rinse my hair out of that way. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. We had to do Caledonia. And we stayed there for a while until we got out to a LST. That was a combat ship with Bow would open up and the trucks and tanks and everything could go out. We went to New Hebrides Island, mm -hmm. in uh, Esperito Santo. It was the main base, First Marine Air Wing, where that's where they shot all their planes from to go over Guadalcanal. All the F uh, Corsair fighters, bombers, Torpedo bombers and regular bombers and the Catalina rescue planes and all kinds of planes. And we were the only ones on there, First Marine Air Wing. So then we, they were telling us, well, we're going off the base. We're going about five miles out up on a hill. They got the radar station all set up. So there was about 40 of us went up officers and technicians. And right below us was the Navy signal tower. But we used to eat Navy chow when we were up there. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> we had Marine Corps chow was all right down below. But over here, they prepared it different. It came tough, but it tasted different. So we stayed there. Yeah, they were raised all the time, bombing and everything. One bother they came over they, they killed the cow out in the pasture. <laughs> the farmer was down below, a French farmer. Mm -hmm. He owned the land and the government took over. And we had, also I had three army technicians with a radio radio signal uh, station down below the hill. There's three of them, that's all. Now uh, they're communicating somehow. We we don't ask questions. And we were not supposed to. Everything was censored. And off in the distance, there was one island. I'll never forget. It was a leopard's island. Obiba. And the leopard colony up there. And now it's legal to be uh, people who go into a leper colony. But at one time, it was, and this island, Esperito, was the cannibal all the time before. In about 1920, they converted to regular. You take New Guinea way up near Rabal, it's, they uh, allow it. It's not against the law to be a cannibal. I just read that lately. Huh. So we stayed there for quite a while because we were all the planes coming in and out and in and out and lost and everything. We were guiding them. We had, I had one guy pilot, he got lost in the Ifati uh, Isle, way out, and he radioed in, and uh, we got a bearing on him. I got a bearing on him, because I was out of scope that time. Got a bearing, and I guided him in to where he was going. I got a letter from him, and uh, I lost him. Oh, I kicked myself for that. But that's the way it is, you know. We had our ships, so Plotting, scope time, plotting, the rest time, and this and that, and guard duty. And I used to take care of the generators. And not the 
maintain it, but just to make sure they're running right. We used to go down to the main base to pick up the diesel oil and the, or the gasoline, because we had big fed of had diesel and gas on it, generated big ones. Down below, we had a, a common diesel generator mounted on a concrete base with a roof on top because the rain won't disturb the generator. Then we had trucks and the three emergency generators on it. We supplied all the power to the Navy outposts and us. And good duty. Now, of course, we got to skip along when they come around at night time. <laughs> One of the guys, he, his technician, he ran out of the, we were in Texas hut. I don't know if you ever heard of a Texas hut. They were like cabins. They put about five or six in the row. They connected and make one barracks out of it. That's what we had up there. And of course, I had a toilet was way out in the Copeland Grove. And walk, the shower was a cold shower. It would warm up during the daytime because it's outside, you know. Fed thing with a screen and a platform out of wood so you could stand on wood instead of dirt. And a lot of fun. When this guy, his technician, the alarm came in, the, the Japs were coming over. So he ran out of the barracks. He, he ran right into the truck. <laughs> he got banged up. I tell you, it's fun. And we have moonshineries out there, too. Me and a lot, had about 40 guys in it, you know. You never know who you were. They were most sure. I don't know when they got the supplies, but they, they had them. The government would give us once in a while about three bottles of beer, Cremo beer, which made in New Britain, Connecticut. But it was the war. I couldn't drink a warm beer. So they gave it right away. <laughs> they took them, don't worry, they took them. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was stayed there quite a while. It was when we left. There was the first Marine Air Wing. When we left, there must have been about seven more wings, air wings in that base. But that's where the main supply was going in, all over, because they were going up north more. So we were kind of left behind now. They were putting airfields in different places. It was time to go home anyway, so we went. To Guadalcanal, we stayed there for a while. Then we went to Bogaville, we stayed there for a while. And from Bogaville, we were supposed to fly to Green Island. I had to go to the bathroom there on Bogaville. So we had a two seater out in the jungle. Because Jack was still there in the woods, even on Guadalcanal. And there was still not, you had to be very careful. Earthquake. And when they get an earthquake, that shed would have had to work because of the toilet. Like this. I was out of state and I got out of there. But good thing I did because I would have been down there. They would never find me. It's like quicksand. So I got out of there. The, the, the toilet was demolished more or less. <laughs> but if I went down there, if they are looking for me, they'd never find me. I'd be still there. No kidding. Yeah. We got there, we had to go out of plane. We got out of plane, they didn't even warm up. DC trees <laughs> took off. The chapter was still there. So we went to Green Island. Our first job down there, we just landed, and a pilot, two pilots, one Marine Corps plane, cracked up in the jungle in Green Island. And they were dead. So they figured, well, we've got a crew over here. This got landed. They give us a hand to get them out and everything. We got them off the plane, down the trees and everything. The trees, put them in body bags and they took them away. That was the first excursion. Now, yeah, they did a good job there. Inter office, inter island communication, verbal communication. Because my voice was different. Not like now, after a stroke, it was 
this, they accommodated me. They said, well, you have a nice voice for going over the radio. And uh, that's the last thing I did. Because when I got back in the States, I had a stroke and in the left eye and a stroke where I couldn't talk, I couldn't use my hand. Mm -hmm. Got out of that. It's, it's life. Well, how did you stay in touch with your family when you was deployed? Uh, the World War Center. We just wrote letters. They got them, but I don't know how they got them. I can't find them. They're, my letters are uh, in South. I can't find them. Hmm. I have a funny idea about what happened to but I lost my photos. I took pictures of the, say, 1938 hurricane and the floods and all that, that time. That was a lot of them. My whole album disappeared. Tom was all of them. I don't know. Nobody was in the house. Maybe my buddies out there, squirrels, that's something. One of them gets out of railing over here in the doorbell, the back door. I wanted to say he's gonna press it, ring the doorbell. He won't budge. He opened the door. He just stayed there. My light goes. Emergency light goes on. He just stayed there until I feed him. Nuts. I don't buy them nuts here. My son gets them down to Maryland where he's stationed, and uh, he brings them up way cheaper. Yeah. He pays for them. I don't pay. Got the peanuts I buy here, and I've read big mixed up over there. I feed them all you all. Well, Joseph, while you was in the uh, military, did you in the Marines? Did you ever have any issues with supply? Uh, what? With problems with supply? Getting supplies, getting stuff you needed? No, no. We went out of the outposts uh, overseas. They got good service there. When they take the care of the Navy and the uh, Reco, that's it. It was a chow, it was chow, it was chow there, dehydrated potatoes, eggs. As long as you have a lot of salt and pepper, you eat it. That's true. Well, did you, did you feel pressure or stress? While you were there, did you feel any pressure or stress while you were there? And no. How did no. you know? I was young, in the twenties. So when I joined up, I think I was eighteen or nineteen. So three years. When I got out. We got married. Came home, Earl. About six months later, we got married. Then my wife went to go to Polish National Home in Hartford. They used to have dances here all the time. When I was on a third day for a little, I was, I don't know, a few drinks. I was on the street in a car, I had a car yet, too. And uh, I knew that her pal, they used to live around there, the girl, they knew her. And she was chumming around with them. But she didn't live there. She was in Hartford here at St. Augustine Church and shit. And, uh, that's the way we met. Well, how did uh, how did you people entertain themselves? How did you guys entertain yourselves in the outpost? Was there any type of entertainment or oh, well, what, uh, we had Jack Benny come out. Really? I saw him. And, uh, but we are the alpha. We didn't go too much to the main base. So you never know when they, they're going to come over, you know, fly over. You got to have you had a crew there all the time. It was good duty, though. Because you had to go to the bathroom, you had to walk a mile to the, the coca grove there. You're used to it. <laughs> you wash your clothes, you wash them while they're dry. Because if you walked away, you wouldn't find them. These guys, they were pretty sharp, you know. Why wash, why wash my clothes when I can take somebody else's? You never, you kind of 
different type of people you meet. So good, good heart and everything, but you'll never know. You take your chances. Oh boy. I like the West Coast, but I wouldn't want to go to the West Coast now in heart to connect half the United States. That island, California, is going to sink one of these days. I will, I will be around, but uh, look around here. All the stuff that's happening, the world is changing. You take it as it is. Do you recall any uh, particular humorous or funny events while you were serving? Well, just normal stuff. But I remember when <laughs> we go from the East Coast to the West Coast, and uh, we're on a train, stopped to New Orleans, and uh, of course, everybody have a few drinks, a potato whiskey we were drinking. And I woke up next morning, I had black and blue marks. Black and blue marks on my forehead. What it was, you know, the wash tubs with the ringers on them, where you put them off and squeeze the water off. I was there like this. I was, I was feeling good. And, and I was on a train. Every time somebody come in, they find out who it was. They picked me up, looked at me, and dropped me on a roller. It's all black and blue. <laughs> I'm telling you. Going to Texas, two days, that was enough. Texas is nice, but not there then. Well, what was what was a typical day like for you when you was in the, in the military, from getting up to through your day? What was it like? I can't. Even, what was your typical day like when you're in the military? You know, from the morning through the evening. Well, you get up, you have exercise. We used to shave the night before because you didn't have time when you have exercise, and you, you got to have it. Shaving all the time. Mm -hmm. We have our breakfast and uh, <clears throat> uh, calisthenics or what do they call them, and exercise and everything. We do our duty and uh, move out when we are on a ship. The 24 hour duty when we got out, off the base, we had our own ship. So many on a ship. So, you get used to it. Uh, they have a queer up there. One of the happy boys, you know. We were, we were closing up the radar because they're moving up north. So we're closing up the radar station. And the, the nursing and the medical took over part of in the woods. Or guys come in, they, they take care of. Well, they had a movie on uh, one night. We were raining. They had a poncho. They went, look, look there. And the guy next to me with a poncho, poncho. His head starts rolling around on me. I said, uh oh. I said, buddy, move. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> We were ready to go. We got back and we we're ready to train to go back again. So they shipped us down to Florida on the main highway. Whitey Beach, I think it was. We lived in a hotel. And in the back was a lagoon with porpoises and everything. We used to watch the porpoises. But then they changed their minds so they moved us back up again. We used to get up in front of the hotel, hitchhike right down to Miami all the time. Everybody would stop and give you a ride. But those are the different days. Very sociable. Mm -hmm. Not like that. We even come up like we used to go traveling down the, to South Carolina, North Carolina, and stop in and get a watermelon. Seven watermelons for a dollar. Man, you fill up the trunk, you got no room in the trunk for it. Not anything, it costs you two dollars of one water, water bottle now, or more. 
Those were different days all together. They even had a car where she drove it. There was a uh, Oldsmobile four barrel carburetor. It just came out. They took it down and stopped in Everglades in Florida for gas. And I told the guys to give me regular gas. Oh, you gotta have high test. That's the first year they even told you that they could use regular gas in there. He wouldn't sell it. Because the four barrel carburetor and everything. That's a good one. I went to the station. They heard about it. I got the regular gas. She used to go to college with it. Good <laughs> good mileage job. Four barrel. Both of them. Nice car. This car I had was a Studebaker. Uh, a pink color with the spare wheels in the trunk and the uh, fenders, one on each side with a four door. Nice. Well, my uh, my sisters, they too big for them. They like to drive, but they, after a while, they didn't want to drive. That's why I took over. I even drove for a blindfold. Why didn't they pay? Up in Hartford, near the Capitol, there's an office building, near Bushland Memorial, it's the state office building. Mm -hmm. He was blind, he had a stand there. You know, cigars, cigarettes, candy, and everything. And uh, he was blind, and uh, he had a terraplane car. And uh, this fellow that used to drive, he enlisted him in the Army. Uh, he was with for a while. But this fellow got enlisted, he landed up in the Philippines. You know where he landed? But not in March. No. Oh. That was the end of it. So, so I, I took over in you know, his spare time. I didn't charge him enough. It was interesting. Then one day we went up to Stafford Springs and uh, up in the woods there. And he knew a lot of these guys. You walk into his little cottage and you look at, oh, hi, hi. Go into the kitchen, pick up the floorboards. There's a hard cider right there. We have a cup. I had a snip of it. I didn't have any more, but it was strong. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. Well, Joseph, let me ask you, have you, uh, did you see any combat while you were in? Well, just the uh, air raids. The air raids. You know. Even going overseas on board ship, they were, we were training with the guns and everything. And this, and this quad, squad for this, squad for that, in case. You never know. For three weeks on board ship, you know, you gotta do something. <laughs> Did you ever go on leave while you were in? Leave? Leave, yeah. Go on leave, go on, uh, you know, any other places you went on, just on vacation to... Oh, well, I like, uh, that's furlough, that's, uh, when we got out of the, not out of the service, but, uh, we came back from overseas, we got a 30-day furlough. So we came home, we had to go back, and we got reassigned for it. That's where we started to train to go back again. But not where we were, we go all further off north. And, uh, but then the war ended. What did you think of the the officers and your fellow your fellow soldiers? We we we, had, uh, we got along pretty good. The officers and everything, even the guys, the moonshiners, but they were normal. That's their lifestyle, so you live with it, that's all. You're going to start trouble with them. Do it with them. If you don't like it, you walk away, that's all. <laughs> Keep neutral, that's the way it is. It's actually like in the civilian life, when I moved from Hartford to Scranton, Pennsylvania, I was a foreman, and I had to go down there and Hire people, about 30 guys. 
Pennsylvania, you ever hear about Pennsylvania? Hunting and fishing? Mm -hmm. They take off. They stay away for a month from work. So every guy I, I interview, I first thing I ask them, do you like hunting, fishing? Yeah. Do you, do you go? They say, yeah. How long do you stay? They say, quite a while. Sorry, bud. Can't. I, I got a crew of 30. Train them and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, neighborhood, I don't know. So where where were you when your service ended? Where were you when your service ended on November tenth, nineteen forty-five? Um, uh, Hartford. Yeah, Hartford. Yeah. You were sta you were stationed in Hartford? Or? No, no, forty-five. Oh, oh, oh no, I came back to Har uh, the was this chart. I came back to Hartford. Was that uh, was? Were you happy to be discharged? Happy to get back to? Well, well my mother and father were there, and my sisters and everything. But I didn't stay a while. I got married. Sixty-six years of married. Mm -hmm. Be sixty-seven on uh, June first. June bride, they used to call. Everybody used to get married June first. Did you make any close friends while you're in the military, while you're in the Marines? A lot of friends, but I forget the names now. That's the way it is. I know I met the guys, but I can't remember the names. And once in a while something comes up in your mind, memories, you know, where you were and everything. But you remember the name, and five minutes later you forget. That's the way it is. So right now I live, live the best I can, that's all. I like to watch the girls play basketball, but you can't. The men, I, they're like, like that. The girls look good. I used to have tickets to the Whalers hockey. Well, the season tickets. And my wife worked in the end, but she got a rake off out of price. And uh, then it got a little, not boring, but you know, every year, every year. So I, this guy in Glasgow, he owns a high, high glass place. He and I, we split tickets. He have so many, I have so many. I mean, he's going to game. Good. Now you're going to be a, poor, a millionaire to go in the game. So what do they charge for a seat? That's on the paper where they charge for what is it? Yankee seat. One game was almost $600 a seat. Black market, too. And people buy them. And they say they got no money. <laughs> Did you, did you by any chance keep a journal while you were in the Marines? We were in the course to do nothing. No memories at all. Mm. That's why we were sent, everything was centered. But they didn't want the Japanese to know where we were. They knew, but a lot of the stuff would get out that what we were doing. And they didn't want that. So all our mail was centered. In and out, as far as I know. It was a good idea because you never know. I wouldn't want to see these guys coming all over every night. They came out every now and then. But dodging bombs all the time, you know. Most of the time they came in to take pictures. What's in the door? Who was there? When? It was strictly confidential. You just keep your mouth shut. That's it. Or the shut it up way. <laughs> it was good duty. We had, I had a hunting license. We went hunting there. 
I had a driver's license, Marine Corps driver's license. We drove a big truck. I got a picture of one of them. And uh, we went to a village where the natives were, and all the women, beetle, nut, face that, faces were all, teeth were all purple and everything. You could have had one of them for a carton of cigarettes. That's your girl. That's true. Give them a carton of cigarettes and you take the girl. That, that's your girl for life. That's the way they live. Same thing like can, uh, being cannibal. I read in that New Guinea. It's not against the law to be a cannibal anymore yet. The government allows it. Terrible. <laughs> I remember, first thing I ever heard of when I got to Esperito Santa, Main Island, where I was, Frank Buck. I don't know if you ever heard of Frank Buck, the hunter. Sounds familiar. He was, a, he was the only one that uh, caught the biggest snake there ever was on that island. I forget what type of snake it was, but I read about it. That's a long time ago. Hmm. Well, I got a picture with a bat. It's not a windy switch it's that big. In the Coca Grove, the picture that I had. 38 pistol here. Uh, I had a hanging on a stick so you can see how the wind spread it. I was young then. Overseas. You couldn't take too many. We not allowed cameras. So I don't know where this guy got a camera to take pictures. Maybe they allowed maybe one just for reference. But uh, the pictures of the group, he took them. I, I used to know every guy, but I don't know, know the guy's name anymore. I already know one guy. Clifford. He came from California. He had a dog. Now, where did he get that dog on the island? He owned a garbage disposal. He used to go into the Pacific Ocean, dump the garbage into the ocean. He owned his own business, but he joined the Marine Corps. But he, he's at the end of the picture, Clifford, he's got a dog in front of him. Where the heck can get the dog on the island? <laughs> he knew somebody, something. He loved dogs. Well, that's the way it is. Being all kinds of characters, though, I'm telling you. Good life. Afterwards, guys are not around now, though. That's a long time. I'm 90. So you figure that out. It's a while ago. Yeah, it is. Were you, uh. I remember when I was a kid. You walked to school. You don't have a bus. You walked. Snow that deep. You walked. And we. You go from a house near Hartford Hospital, you know where that is? Mm -hmm. Right, that's where the, my father had a house near there, on Hudson Street, right out of the corner with Jefferson and Hudson. We lived on Hudson. Catherine Hepburn, you ever heard of her? Mm -hmm. She was born there. 19, no, 1919, I think she was born. She was a little older than I was. She was born there, and her father was a doctor, and his son was a doctor. My wife went to there, and they put up the Hartford Hospital. I used to have a lot of friends, Seymour Street, all around there, but the Hartford Hospital took over. And they had a house, not in the house, just plain show. My father fixed it all up, put a bathtub in there, not showered. You had a toilet, but outside the toilet, in the hallway, was a sink. Never in the toilet. 
Downstairs we had the toilet with the top, you know, old, mm-hmm. old chain, and uh, a bathtub. With no hands, wash the hands. Wash your hands with outside. You take a bath before the bathtub. Here's a big tub. Get it in the kitchen. Fill it up with hot water. Had a cold stove. Hot the water. That's the way we took a bath. Hand pump, water, gas, gas light, no electric. Everything. Dirt cell. It was a great life. Outside head, we had to go to toilet outside. My job was to follow the horses when they walked down the street. If they let go, I said, my mother would tell me, she said, go pick it up. She said, put it in the garden. She said, beautiful flowers and everything. That's the way he lived. Well, just while you were in the military, while you were in the Marines, were you awarded did you receive any uh, medals or, or citations? Well, the we regular ribbons and everything. We yeah. got one from the Connecticut. Uh, Sitting on a ball board in the room. Met a ribbon and everything. Do you remember what they were for? Or? It's the Connecticut. Uh, it's written there. Okay. Got a picture. Then I got a picture in the hallway here of the new building in Washington, D.C. Because I used to go there for quite a while, but but Joey used to go to college, Georgetown. We knew all the places in Washington, D.C. And uh, what did it say? Somewhere over there. Went to the Smithsonian Institute and uh, the degree high speed book, stamps. I was going in the 30s with my next door neighbor uh, and invited me to go to the insurance company in Harvard. They had a stamp collection meeting there and everything. And they got a big piece of paper with Japanese stamps. That was in 1937. I got up and nothing. The, the guy gave it to me. We went to the Smithsonian. There it was that setup of stamps was part of their collection. But half the stamps were missing. Mine were all full, but I lost one. I still got it. I don't know it's worth money. My son will look at it. He'll think. Well, <clears throat> Joseph, can you tell me how did your military experience influence your thinking about war and the military in general? Uh, one thing, I don't like the way they play war in our games. That's why the guys, you see a report on how many guys commit suicide? And how many guys got killed? Did? Figures. Reverse. This is a paper yesterday. So many dead, so many women. More dead than women. Imagine that. And I don't like the way that. You notice uh, a lot of these countries, they don't have tanks. They have a pickup truck with a machine gun on it. That's no way to fight a war. I think different organizations, they would kill anybody. Bomb. They get a person that says, they pay them off maybe a couple hundred dollars to put a bomb on them, you go and blow yourself up, but the family gets the money. That's not war. That's terrible. And the way the girls have to dress up, get the eyes showing. Be normal. Show your face at least, because you never know what you're thinking about. Eyes don't tell you all of it. True. Look, look at your face, your smile will tell what you are. That's true. Well, that's the way it works. Look at that. 
kill the Uyghurs. 60, 70,000 people died already. It's a war there. They don't care. They just like tanks. They kill them. Did you join any veterans organizations over the years? Uh, BFW or? I was going to, but I never did. I was too busy I was working there. I had one job. I worked in the Hamilton Standard. Ten years. And, uh, I was on a night shift. Four o'clock in the afternoon to four in the morning. Twelve hour shift. Thirteen days on, one day off. I did that for ten years. I got tired, man. You know what we were working on? We don't know. The stuff was shipped out to Skunk Works in California. Maybe you heard about it. It's the fastest airplane in the world. Just lately, went up. They made about 35 of them. The plane Take off from the field, go up, and that's when they put fuel in it. They got enough fuel to get up there. Then they load them up for full tank across the country within an hour. That's how fast they're going. Then he couldn't land. He had to be refueled again, enough to get down below. Wow. <laughs> and we worked. 12 hours a day, 13 days on, one day off. Night shift. That was rough. A lot of times you didn't have any work. Uh, our schedule was like you work an inspector, an engineer, and I would work all the, as a crew. So, that's the way it worked. That was the secret. You don't know what you were doing, but you were doing it. The temperature of the, of the oil, not the lubricator, but the high fluid that operates these little, little sensors, they're all worth a million, 500 degrees. Then we used to calculate after we were doing all the work. And on our test rigs and everything, and quotas and everything. Yeah, you know what a manometer was? A glass tube filled with mercury. Normal, it would be about that high. So we would say, to go up to the ceiling. That's how high, but this plane would go up 23, 28 feet, 30, 30 miles up with no air around. Pressure is different in every. We should have to go on a step ladder to get our reading. That's how I used to, my legs used to hurt after a while. I was a good job, but uh, nobody bothered me. Everything was single, you don't know where you go. And everything was, all the seals were put in with dry ice. So they contract. Then you swell up and seal it. If you got one drop of oil leaking, take it apart. It had to be perfect. That's good work. But those days, you, you weren't getting paid like you do now. When I started with 50 cents an hour, now these guys are getting 20, 25 dollars an hour. Of course, you're that much to live, too. So. We used to buy a market butter. It used to be coming a tub, go to the market there. You don't get a pot of butter. It's like a big spoon they give away. Uh, three quarters of the Okay, we'll take three quarters. Well, Joseph, how, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Do you feel that your experiences in the I, military affect your was, life? I, I enjoyed it because it was, it was different. I went traveling more, I saw more, and I learned more. So quite a, I had a pretty good job. I was a foreman there for a while. Then moved out and, and 
Carol didn't like the schoolwork over there and everything. So we moved back. I had a house built there, and I had a house in here, and then I got this house, it's a third house now. Make a living. Well, you live and learn, that's all. You're going to have to live and learn. Well, Joseph, I think we're, we're going to wrap this up. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't covered yet? No, I was almost there. Right. Do I have anything? Well, I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for, for offering to, it's to cool. the interview. I, I like it. <laughs> you know, it's different. That's what I like. 